for coming. Um, author James S. Parker has led a successful business career over the last 30 years in telecommunications. A graduate of Eastern Kentucky University, his background in the field of criminology has come alive in his writing, giving authenticity to his storyline and his characters. His first two books, The Dark Side of the Cross and Relic of Darkness, have met with strong critical acclaim. James and his wife, Margaret, reside in Austin, Texas, along with their daughter. Please welcome James Parker. Well, Dr. Wine, thank you for being here. And just again, thank you, thanks to Walter, uh, you know, for the opportunity to do this. Um, writing is such a, a uh, I'll call it a masochistic game, uh, because you spend so much time alone. It's you, yourself, and you. And when something comes out with, with, with the writing, and it goes really well, well, that's great. You feel wonderful. But unlike the normal world, when something comes out and it doesn't get good reviews, there's none of this because there's only one name on the cover. And so that makes it kind of interesting uh, and, and kind of masochistic. Uh, Dark Side of the Cross, for me, is, is a uh, big milestone in the sense it's the first thing that I, I ever wrote that actually got out there. Uh, a lot has happened with this book over the years. Uh, it was picked up two and a half, three years ago. It's a small studio that was looking to make a film with a screenplay on it, uh, which is a totally separate form of writing. I've never been involved in that. Uh, and then the idea was, as we were going through this, some of the things that I wrote in this book in the initial, in the initial run were almost tongue-in-cheek. Never thought this thing would see the line of day. And when I was going through it with the studio, they're like, you've got to change these names. And, and Don, who was one of the first people to ever read it, uh, you know, caught all these things. And says, you, know, you need to change that, you need to change this. Uh, and they were right. And they were right. And it's like, you know, he, he can attest to where that thing was. Um, but now that this has been picked up, it's been picked up by a new publisher, uh, Post Hill Press, out of New York, Nashville. Um, so it's back out on, with this. Uh, we have a couple more things with the writing that are, that are in, in the pipeline. So, but it's just something that's like anything else you do in business, anything else you'll ever do in your life. If you want to be good at it, you want to try it, you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And then eventually, you hope it falls into the right hands. So, you know, today I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I don't do a lot of this in the sense of reading from the book. But there, there's a point to this. I'm just going to read a very brief piece here because I, I want to talk to you about um, so many organizations that I talk to who are book clubs or even classes where the people are attending school and you come in as a published author and talk about your writing and so forth, have never met a voracious reader that really didn't have a book somewhere up here. But the idea of getting it started and how to do it and so on, they never really, they really tried. And that's pretty much how this was. I had the idea for a story. didn't know if I could get it down on paper. But let me just, uh, to start with this, uh, Dark Side of the Cross uh, is about a character by the name of James McBride, who is a detective, works for a very large law firm that has kind of a elite clientele. And in book one, the client is the Catholic Church. And in New England, they've had several books go for a while. Nothing turns up anywhere, black market, anywhere. So one day a priest gets a call offering, offering to ransom them back. Well, they want them, they're old, they're fragile and Archbishop himself is going to go to the exchange. And he explains to him, no, that's not what you do. When the law firm catches wind of that, that's what we do. And so our hero addresses a priest goes to the exchange. He's been standing in a very, very bad, bad part of town, something that uh, while my character would go there, I never would. So it kind of gives you some insight to me as well. But I want to just give you a little bit, just of a, a quick reading on this, on where he was. Um, they've made the exchange. They're trying to catch this guy. Uh, and the guy has taken off on him. This is McBride had made it out of the building and into the street just as the van skidded to a halt, the left front tire barely missing one of the artifacts. He looked just in time to catch sight of the thief, turning into an owl. As he ran down the street, he unzipped his jacket, reached behind him, and pulled the gun free of the bindings that secured it in place. McBride his luck held. As he entered the alley, he caught sight of the thief, darting into the building two-thirds of the way down on the left. It didn't take him long to reach the same red brick structure. The thief had disappeared down a small flight of stairs, leading to what looked like the door to a basement. On his radio, he had, Corey, I'm going into this four-story brick building. There aren't any lights on that I can see. There's a green dumpster next to the door. And with that, McBride and sent As soon as he entered, he flattened against the wall and listened. He didn't dare use his flashlight. There wasn't any sound, but at the end of the long hallway, he could see faint light. He gave his eyes a little more time to adjust, and then quietly and cautiously as he could, he moved down the hall, the light from the room, the door partially open. McBride stood by the door, gun ready. He didn't know what to expect on the other side, but felt sure the thief was there 
ready to take him out at first chance. It had been too easy. He glanced around the door, and what he saw surprised him even more. The thief sat on the far side of the room at a small table, in his young early 20s, and boned them. On the table were three candles, accounting for the light. The thief had the money spread out before him. He was counting it, as if he had all the time in the world. When Ryan burst into the room, his gun leveled the thief's chest. The thief stood up, knocking over a chair, but froze at the sight of the gun. He did some things right, but for the most part, you were pretty stupid, said the brain. Now, interlace your fingers behind your head and kneel down. And they go back and forth at that point on who sent him, why he was there, and what had motivated the theft. And then things began to change. The sudden change in the air hit McBride with a jolt. He blinked his eyes a few times as the light in the room quickly faded. Glancing at the candles, he saw that even though they continued to burn just as they had when he'd arrived, the light they put out was greatly diminished. McBride looked around, trying to find the reason that would explain what was happening. The thief, mortified, scooted back against the wall, his eyes wide, darting from side to side. They're here. The whisper of his voice, so intense, so filled with terror that it got them bright. What little light there was continued to weaken and to retreat back into the flames. You've got to let me go, the thief begged, tears streaming down his face. We've got to get out of here now. I don't want to die. Shut up, the bright nearly shouted. The thief's panic was contagious, and the unexplainable loss of light didn't help him. Then, just as suddenly, the temperatures in the room plummeted. The cold, more penetrating than anything McBride had felt in a long time, cut through him with such force that it nearly brought him to his knees. The thief's eyes looked, locked, onto something across the room. He pointed at the door and began to scream. McBride strained his eyes but couldn't see anything, at least not at first. But there was something there, something standing between them and the doorway, blocking their only way out. A darkness filled the space where the door had been, a darkness so complete, so intense, that light was absolutely useless against it. Without any sound, it entered the room and began to glide toward them. A nearly paralyzing fear washed over McBride, leaving his mouth dry, unable to swallow, and he felt the tingling needles of numbness rapidly spreading through his body. He tried to speak, but couldn't form the words. He wanted to shoot at it, defend himself, but couldn't raise his arm. The lack of control over his body further fueled his mind with panic. He tried to grasp some of the underlying of what was happening, feeling as if he was drowning in a sea of darkness. It was his last thought, as he felt himself falling, passing out on the floor. So when McBride goes through this terrifying thing, and who is McBride? Who, when you have law enforcement uh, people, who are these people? What are they like? I have the greatest admiration for our policemen, our firefighters, our first responders. They are amazing people. And when I was in college, I got recruited by one of the agencies, uh, law enforcement-wise, from a federal standpoint. And they asked me to stick around and do my graduate work in criminology, which I did. And I was amazed at the people I was training with. Because these were very selfless people. I mean, they, they were anxious to get out there and, and do good. But they were very down to earth people. Their world was very black and white. And what happened to me riding in his basement and other things is he gets closer to this, the worse it gets. There is something supernatural here that he's coming up against. And that's not a part of his world. In fact, you know, not too long after that scene in the book, when he comes to and the thief is dead and the artifact is gone, the money's still there, but everything else is gone. His hands are like this. He has to hold on to something when he's talking to his boss if he won't see his kinship. And the worst thing that could happen to anyone in that profession, that's what he thinks is going on, he's losing his nerve. And you can't handle that. The character of McBride has done well. I think people like McBride because he is human. He doesn't have the big red S on his chest. Uh, he, he's not superhuman. He makes mistakes. He gets knocked down. But he's getting back up. And that's really the key. Uh, the scene in the building, has all the elements you want. It's a dark night, it's a bad part of town. Uh, you have an enclosed place, it's very claustrophobic. Uh, these are all things that will help build suspense and build for your reader. But the other thing that I think that I wanted to bring up by doing this reading uh, was a true story that I wanted to share with you about how to keep your readers off balance. You do not want to become predictable. You want the reader surprised. You want them to enjoy the story and keep going because they don't know what's coming next. And some of you are familiar with the story, some of you aren't. But my wife, my daughter, and I have traveled to Scotland two or three times. I love Scotland. Wonderful people, beautiful place. And the second time we went back, we stayed at a castle outside Edinburgh called Dalhousie. And Dalhousie, uh, you can look it up, it, it has some web page, D-A-L Housing. Beautiful, been the Ramsey family for like 700 years, so forth and so on. I came across Dalhousie uh, 
by watching the History Channel. Scotland's most haunted. This castle supposedly one of the most haunted sites in Scotland. I didn't share this with my wife and daughter until it was about a week before our arrival, so it was too late to change it. We were locked in. So when we get there, we checked in, we're up in our room. They put us on the third floor. That was the top floor. That was by accident, not design. But the sun was set. We could hear thunder uh, across the valley. I was in Scotland. I'm in a haunted castle. I personally was in hog heaven. But we forgot something in the car. Naturally, I'm elected to go get it. Well, it's a castle. There are no elevators. So I got to the stairwell. The stairwell was amazing. It was like eight feet across. We'd go down. There'd be the switchback. And then down on the second floor. And when I got to a point where I was between the second and third floor on that switchback, I could see down to the second floor. And there was a massive stone wall. But in that wall, there was a window. And it was rectangular, but had an arch in the center. And this window had a wooden grate. The wooden grate was open. I could see through. I could see another staircase. I'm thinking, my goodness, this place is huge. Well, I want to see what's in that window. So I walked down the stairs, I walked up to it, and just as I put my face up to the window to look through, there was another face right here. Folks, it was a mirror. I scared the hell out of myself with a mirror. And that's the kind of story you can put in your things. You know, we, it's scary what we ride went through here. But later on, you can build up the suspense to where he's scaring himself. And a couple times that happens in this. There, there's a scene where he's, he's staying in the small town looking and he hears a disembodied voice calling his name. And he's already shook as it is. Well, sits up to find out it's just a speaker from the main house calling him. You know, so work with your reader. Don't ever, don't ever let them know what's coming next. Don Webb has worked with me now on just about everything I write. And Don is easily my right arm plus some. Uh, just an amazing man. Uh, he teaches full time, he writes full time. Um, you need to look Don up. You know, he has so many stories out there, and, and this year has been selling several. And just a very, very talented individual, and I'm honored to him. And when we were first editing the book, when I talk about not letting your, your reader know what's coming, we were going, to, we got to a part of the book, he had been editing, and he said, okay, we need to fix this. And this is a scene where when Bryden is preparing to go collect these artifacts, and the Archbishop has sent over a priest with the getup that he needs, the, the, the collar, cross, so forth and so on. So he will look like a priest when he goes to this meeting. But I had the priest show up, and Brian got dressed as a priest, had the guy leave, and that was pretty much it. And I'll never forget this, and I tell this story all the time. Don looked at me, and he said, Jim, you are suffering here from Curse of the Red Shirts. And I said, Don, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, Jim, did you ever watch Star Trek as a kid? I said, well, of course. He said, and who would beam down to the planet with Kirk and Spock? Well, the guys in the red shirts. He goes, exactly. Well, what did you know about them? Well, I knew if anybody was going to get killed, it was going to be them. He said, exactly. You knew in your heart you'd never see them again. And folks, that's exactly what would happen. So what Don's advice to me was, and this is held with me, and I've tried to do it since then, is give the character a quirk. He may only be there for that one page. Describing, giving a quirk, this, this made this priest pissed off. He was not happy to be there. And he was just annoyed with Brian every time he tried to do something. We gave him a, we gave him a personality. But we didn't let the reader know, you'll never see him again. And those are the little things that help you to write, help you to do it. If, if you're just starting to write, you're just looking to do this, two things I would strongly suggest. First, find yourself a critique group. These are people who are out there and they're writing what you're writing. If you're writing poetry, if you're writing Chick lit, if you're writing mysteries, whatever you're writing, sci fi, it doesn't matter. There are other people out there doing what you're doing. Find your critique, get involved. And they're going to give you feedback. So you'll hand out a chapter and they'll read it, and everybody gives you their stuff back, and you go through and you see what their comments are. Well, let's say they found 10 things wrong with what you wrote. It's your story. Never forget that. Four of their comments, yeah, those are good. Good catches. Those I'll accept. These other six, out of here, my story. So you do have to have that level of discipline. And then once it's done, then you find someone like that. And I was lucky enough to find him via some classes that I took on characterization and dialogue and everything else. But that editor will save your life. And the rewrite is a painful, painful process. I know by the end of the first book on the rewrite, I was ready to shoot my own hero. Because it's just a condensing, condensing, condensing. But when it's done, 
then you have something that you can go out and try to sell. So the writing, is, it, it's, it's hard, it's interesting, but when you do start, keep in mind, it is your business. You always hear people say, well, I'd love to own my own business. A lot of people say that, and I normally don't think they know what's involved. This is the person who turns the lights on in the morning and turns them off at night. First in, first out. And writing is your business. In particular, as a young writer, and by young, I mean new in the business. You haven't written a lot. You're not some of the big names we're all familiar with. And like Hollywood, there's a handful of those. You're going to do most of the marketing. You're going to do most of, the, most of whatever advertising out there. Social media, great help. Get engaged. But that falls on you. So that's really all the remarks I just wanted to make today. It was just in the sense that, you know, when you are writing, um, you have to help the reader along, but don't become predictable. Don't let your reader know things that you don't necessarily want to know, i.e. the small character not coming back. You want to keep them engaged. You want to make sure they turn that next page and that they tell people about it. So you've been very patient through this monologue. Uh, just open up to any questions anyone may have. Yes, um, And when writing the story, um, did you have like the whole plot kind of already in mind, or did you like kind of discover it as you were writing, like what was going to happen? Great question. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I just sit down and start writing, and I go where the, where the story takes me. I, I don't know how to do that. You're going on a trip, and you don't know where you're going, how are you going to know when you get there? You know, it's one of those. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, I had an outline. Here's what happened in chapter one, here's what happens in chapter two, and so forth. Now, the story changed dramatically by the time I was done, but it kept me on track. I could go through it, and I've written chapter one, and I can go back to my outline and make sure those points are on there. And the reason those points are on there is you have to give them clues also. This is mystery fiction. It's a detective solving a crime. And what you can't do is have the great uncle from Ireland show up in the last chapter and solve the whole thing. No one will ever pick up anything else you ever write. So you just have to give them clues as you go along. So yes, very much an outline, very much followed it, but it does expand as you go. You get closer to the characters, they do take on more life, and you are creating these characters. And while you need a very good, strong, you, you want a good guy who's believable, I'll say. You know, I'm not sure James Bond is believable, but you want, a, you want a good guy who's believable. But the bad guy can be equally as important. You know, we didn't even see the bad guy in Jaws till late in the film. But I was terrified of getting one. And it's just, you know, there's that kind of thing. So you have to do that. But no, that, that's a great question. And, and I would encourage you to know the story, particularly in the mystery. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's going to be tough to get clues as you go know. along. There, there, there's a thing in here that I just knew people would stumble to before they ever got to me. And they didn't do it. And it's been amazing how many people would come to me later and say, oh, I couldn't believe. I missed that whole thing. And I'm like, oh, glad you did. Because, you know, you want, it's there. You showed it to them. You don't want to catch on that early. No, thank you. Let's go. Yes? Uh, three questions. How long did it take you to write the book? How did you come up with the character names? And how did you come up with the name of your book? This took probably close to 10 years because it was start stop. And I had no idea what I was doing. Um, again, a member of our audience can attest to that. We, uh, when I did finally finish writing towards the end, I had already never gone through a couple classes. and. Here again, Don, a story I tell about you all the time. Uh, I called him. I'm excited as hell. I just wrote the words about him. Never thought I'd get there. And I called Don and I said, what do we do? I'm ready to hit the publishers, movie houses, let's do it. And he goes, great. He goes, do you have it printed in? I said, yes, I do. He goes, all right, I want you to put it in a box. I said, a box the paper came in. I said, excellent. Put it in a drawer. I said, what? He said, put it in a drawer and walk away. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I want you to pull it out six months later and I want you to read it. And you're going to find it's the biggest piece of tripe you've ever read. <laughs> I lasted three months, pulled it out, sadly, Don was right. And we, we, uh, we began the rewrite. As far as the naming, naming is, is really, really critically important. I mean, you know, let me give you an obvious one Cruella de Vil. That's ah, got a bad guy written on it. I mean, that's just, but the, the names are important, names are strong. Um, I have two sources that I would use. I actually have a character naming book that I have relied on heavily. And it gives me everything by nationality. Here are Czechoslovakian names, here are Irish names, here's this, some history on how those things happen. Uh, but name is very, very important. You know, for, for me to have Brighton, um, two things. We, we love Scotland, we love the Scots, we've been there now three times. And my mother's maiden name is MacArthur. 
And so I already had, a, had an affinity for the Scots. And by having Brian as his name, I could call him back. You know, so there it was. And so, but that was, that was his name. But the other names are critically important you know, when you're going through them. Uh, Colin, Father Colin Sherry, a priest who plays a critical role in the book. When you look at the meanings behind those words, what does Colin mean with the Sherry? There are meanings behind every name out there. Look up your own name. It, it's pretty amazing what you'll find. But and names can change. I can look up James, and it's going to be different definition-wise from what the Hebrews would tell you versus what the English would tell you. So it's just. I mean, if someone say, okay, if you want to be a bestseller, you need to have a 200 pages, or you need to have 300 pages, or you need to have 300 pages, or how does that all work? Connie, I don't know. Um, mine was as long as the story took. Um, I, I think you know. Don, is there an average size on? Well, in general, first novels tend to be, they need to be at least 86,000 words long. They're not going to sell anything shorter than that. But there is a kind of a creeping tendency to books being too big these days, as you may have noticed. Uh, but the, the, what usually happens when someone first tries to write, they're pouring, like, man, I've written my novel, and they're it's 40,000 words. That's novella. Novella is Spanish for unpublishable. <laughs> There's no market. Um, the, the weird thing about books is they are artifacts. Someone prints them and puts them out and sells them. And you have to be aware of that after you've done your creative piece. You can't be aware of it while you're doing your creative piece unless you're either really gifted or, or, tech, or very ungifted. Um, and you have to also never look at what, uh, what else is being published because you'll find things so amazingly awful you will assume, oh, my work will sell. Has nothing to do with that. Uh, I'm a good friend of Reverend Lionel Fanfort, who has the distinction, no doubt, of being the worst writer in the world. Uh, and he brought out 250 novels. And they are all bad. They are all really, really bad. They're, they're Guinness record bad, such as Galaxy 666, no doubt, the worst book ever written on the planet. But he had a publisher that wanted to buy his stuff. You know, when you're starting out with your own thing, trust in your story because what you gotta live with ultimately is your story. And a lot of novels won't get, get out there. You know, I have 24 published books. I have three that I can't sell at all. I love one of them, I think it's marvelous. I know something must be horribly wrong with it. And I love it so much I won't let anyone look at it, which is a bad sign. Yeah, it's just, Connie, it's how long the story takes. And do you just keep going to publisher after publisher until one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you take the rejection letters, they're your, your badges on. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's, um, and I probably have the numbers wrong in this, so I think I was sharing earlier. God, the feel with the uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. If you've seen any of those yeah. books that are out here. Um, oh, they got hundreds of rejections before that was picked up. And they, you know, became very successful. Yes. Jim, you get an idea to write a book. How much of it do you put down before you go to your editor or your mentor or whoever it is to decide, yeah, this is something to pursue? Does that make sense? It does. I've only, I've only done that once. Um, I've had, you know, the idea for this book I had on my own. And frankly, at the time, I had nobody to talk to. Uh, we were living out in South Washington, right across the river in Portland, Oregon. And as I was just getting started to write the outline, I knew the story. I knew the story in my heart, I knew it in my head. As I went through the outline, there was a book fair, book festival held in Portland. And I went over and I met this lady. Uh, if you had called Central Casting and said, send over Marilyn, this is who they would send. And sweet British lady, and she had like seven or eight novels there at her stand that she was selling them. And I, I talked to her and I said, you know, I'm just starting to write. You know, here's my plan. What do I do? Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I quit my job so that I can focus on this writing? And she grabbed my arm. She goes, "Sweetheart, never, never, never quit your job. You know, because the writing doesn't pay that well. You need to really build up a volume of work before this starts to kick in." But back to your question, you know, I took that idea and ran with it. Uh, this character was received well. Uh, the second writing novel. Uh, they still like it. Uh, and I was in the midst of writing number three um, when an uh, agent I'm working with called me 
and said, hey, and we're working now with these publishers, they're apprehensive of buying book two and book three because they don't own book one. Post to Press owns book one. And I said, well, it's not a trilogy. It's not like if you haven't read the first one, you can't read the second one before. They, they stand alone. She said, nevertheless, it's a stumbling block right now. Do you have another idea? And that is when, you know, the answer was yes. And I said, but, you know, Esther, it's a little involved. You know, when you want to talk about it, we set up a time first thing Monday morning. So I had all weekend to, to be nauseated about this and um, told her the story. And I so wanted to be in front of her. I told Martin, I said, I think maybe I should just drop in at her office. Rather than do this over the phone, just drop in. And she talked me out of that. She was not a bad idea. And so we did it over the phone. Well, she loved the idea. She bought into the idea. And that's the first time I've ever done it. It's the first time I've ever pitched an idea. So now, so that we can go to these publishers to get their input. She's already got the meeting set up to where I would be meeting with her creative folks. But she doesn't want to just sit down and have a meet. She wants to go in with something to sell. So, so with this first book, you had it actually finished? Oh yeah, I, I got the thing written. And I had met Don via some classes that I took that he, he taught. Don agreed to edit. Uh, once that was done, only at that point did I start reaching out to try to find somebody to write. Because at that point, that's when I hit a problem. You know, oh, and another good piece of advice that Don gave to me too, if, again, if you're writing, when you are doing your first book, you know the story, you know it pretty well, and you are passionate about it, you believe in it, you've got to, and you'll never make it to the end. So you've got to believe it. Um, but I, I remember calling him and he would edit it, and he said, one question, does your hero die in the end? And I said, no, why? He said, because if he does, no publisher will ever touch you. Because if he does well, they're going to want to book two, book three, book four, and unless you're Stephen King and you're not, you can't bring him back. So don't do that. So, but, but it makes sense. You, don't, you want to have something that works, something that sells, and you keep going. But no, that's the first time I ever pitched that idea. And I'm now, the, the package I'm pulling together for her that she requested was a synopsis, subplot, who are recurring characters, and give me chapter one. And that's a big order. But we're on, on point that together. Yes? Anybody else? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, you seem to know a lot about law enforcement. So does that come from experience or watching old dragnet shows? Or uh, so what's your basis for what you know? <coughs> of course, I'm too young to watch dragnet. Uh, <laughs> 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 it, 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 it wasn't that funny. But anyway, um, no, it, it, the school was going. When I got recruited, uh, I foolishly said yes. Yes, I would do that. And I started going to criminology, and then I got to spend some time in some actual basic ones and marine base, and one of we got tra training. And I was kind of looking at it the wrong way. I was having a great time. For me, it was like Boy Scout camp for adults. It's like, you mean today we get to shoot that? Really? Yes. You know, and, and but you know, criminology, you've got to look at what that is. Criminology is the science of crime. If you're going to be a good guy and you're going to fight crime, you take criminology because they have to teach you what it is and how it works. But it's not a Boy Scout science. If you're going to be the bad guy, you take criminology because it's the science of crime. And they're going to teach you how it's done, why other people have failed, what perhaps worked. So it, it's an interesting field. And I think uh, the closer and closer I got to graduation, I realized you know, having a family one day meant more to me than anything else. And any job I have where I have to carry a gun, for intents and purposes, puts me at risk. And so I went a different direction. But that's where that comes from, that, that schooling and that at those experiences. Oh, sorry. I was hoping you were going to say it was prison time or something. <laughs> we didn't get a lot of training in prison. No. We didn't have, we didn't have. Anything else? Well, yes, sir. I just have one question that I came to me. Um, so, like, you, you know, you're a businessman and you study criminology and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, was, like, writing always something that interested you, or did it come, like, later in no, you know, that actually started in high school a little bit. And then uh, in college, I was doing different articles and such for like the school paper and this sort of thing. Um, and I had written like one or two little short stories. And actually, it, it, when you get into writing, I think short stories are probably harder to write than a full length novel because everything you want to do, you got to get done quicker and less time. And it's much more compact. Um, but no, I, yeah, the writing had always interested me. Um, and I did exactly what Don said not to do. I mean, 
when I got into the writing and was writing the story. I loved it. When I was at Barnes and Noble, I would pick up a book and read the cover or whatever, and it sucked. It was terrible. Because my whole thought was, this can get published. <laughs> you know, I was thinking of the idea. So it was encouraging in that respect. But I think we're, we're, where anybody else is concerned who wants to write, yeah, any day of the week, walk into Barnes and Noble, the shelves are packed with books. People are buying them, they're, they're, they're publishing them, they're putting them out. And every single person in there, at one point in their life, two, three, four, five times in their life, said, I can't do this, I'll never get this done. You know, uh, that little voice inside of us is probably one of the worst critics we have to worry about. Because that, that's the guy who has the most influence over you and will do his best to stop you. And don't let that happen. Uh, now, once you have written something, the hardest part is, I think, when you hand it to friends and family and they read it and say, ah, it's good. You want to believe it. <laughs> but are they just being nice? Is it family? Is it friends? So forth. And what's so weird is, you know, I've had the opportunity to be at the Texas Book Festival and sold books there and then gotten emails from people who came in and bought the book. People I couldn't pick out of the line and told me, well, that's what I enjoy. And for whatever reason, it kind of has more credibility than our friends and family, because we don't know much we're being sheltered or shielded. And so, uh, so that makes it that makes a challenge. But yeah, that little voice inside of you, pay no attention to it. All right. Well, folks, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, if you haven't signed up, we're going to give a free copy away later. If you want to purchase a copy, they're over there. I'd be happy to sign in with you. And then uh, if I haven't gotten your name and your email address, we have some things over there. Also, uh, there's information about where my author page is on Facebook and web page. And we're creating a blog on that. And it's, we want it to be interactive. It's going to be for like writers, aspiring writers, and frankly, readers of, of good fiction who just want to get out there. But we want to make it as interactive as possible. And there'll be guest bloggers and won't always be listening to me. But, um, again, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it.